All right, so we'll get started here. Uh, I just mentioned before some of you came in that uh, the slides for today are, are in the week six. I just uploaded them about an hour ago. You'll also wanna download the RVU calculation example 2021 PFS. You'll need that to do homework 6B. And I'm gonna go over that today. Um, all right, so let me see. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order for the uh, slides. <clears throat> Cause I'm gonna try to make sure we cover some. Um, I get going and talking about stuff and I get excited about it. And, and then we wind up running out of time at the end for some import. So I'm gonna make sure we're gonna, we're gonna kind of hit things a little bit out of order. So it's gonna be a little disjointed, um, but you know, we'll make it all work. So, okay, so to understand any industry, and how the actors in that industry behave, you have to understand how they make money, okay? It's really that simple. It's that crass, but it's also just that simple, right? So healthcare, most people get into healthcare, they have that first intuition, hey, I'm a smart person. You know what I should do? I should be a doctor, right? Or I should be an OT, or I should be a whatever, right? As opposed to, I should be a computer programmer, right? Um, you know, most of the people who are in healthcare are smart enough that they could do something else and make, you know, make pretty good money doing something else. You know, so, you know, most people are motivated to get into healthcare because they actually want to help people. But once you have, once you've said, okay, I'm going to be a doctor, right. Then you're presented with a menu of choices, you know, postgraduate school, uh, post-medical school about what specialty you're going to go into. And that's the point where you have to say, you know, um, well, you have to say, what kind of medicine do I like? That's a piece of it. But also, you know, you're going to go into that with eyes wide open that if you choose, you know, family medicine, you're going to be kind of at the bottom of the earnings uh, chart. And if you choose, um, you know, orthopedic surgery with a specialty in um, hip replacements, you'll probably be at the top of the chart. And so you got to make those choice. you know, you make those choices. Both of them are wonderful and help people. Um, and they have some differences, but to understand why someone might choose, you know, someone who's on the bubble, maybe could, could go either way is probably going to tilt toward the one that pays more <clears throat> to understand, but more than that. So, so that's just like at a personal individual level, right? When you see people choosing to track into different majors, different, like you came here and you chose your major, if you have already, you've probably at least gave, some of it you gave thought to was, this is something I really care about. Hopefully that's really top in your mind. I chose to be a philosophy major as an undergrad, not because of the high earning potential, I'll tell you that. Um, uh, uh, but, but, you know, hopefully you at least gave some thought to, gosh, I'm really fascinated by whatever your major is. And oh, by the way, I can see how that'll make me some money at some point, somewhere down the line. Right. So what you see people making choices, you have, they, they're, people are, you know, from an economic perspective, right? I'm an economist by training, people are rational, they make choices like, you know, along the lines of this makes me happy, this makes me money, right, and they move away from things that this makes me unhappy, this doesn't make me any money, right. Um, so people are rational and make these choices. Systems then get built up around systems get built up around these sorts of choices. So if you are running a healthcare organization, for example, and this applies again to any industry, if you're running an organization, you have to ask yourself, how does my, you know, um, what is the purpose of my organization? That's one, right? And then two is, how am I going to finance this organization? How am I going to keep money flowing into this organization so that the organization can continue to exist? And all organizations have to ask that question all the time. And, and, and whether you are, you know, a restaurant, a clothing store, right, or a hospital, it doesn't matter. Every organization needs to be to have positive cash flow, meaning money coming in, more money coming in than money going out. So to understand the to understand any industry, you have to ask yourself, how does the how do these how do the organizations in this industry make money? Right. So this is what we're going to talk about 
kind of in this chapter is, and what I'm going to start with, with you, even though this is really like slide 29 in the deck, um, is we're going to look at how physicians bill. So that's the purpose of this first part of the, of the lecture. Um, and you need to understand that how physicians bill directly influences how the organizations are built around that. Right. So the physician is the is, you know, to use a phrase out of like law is a rainmaker. Right. Meaning meaning they bring the money into the organization. Everybody else is support. Right. We're all wonderful people, but the only people that generate that that or the people that activate the organization are the physicians and the nurse practitioners and the PAs. Right. So the people who can actually bill. So everything else is built around that. Now, the physicians. In this, in this day and age, the physicians themselves don't actually do most of the billing. They do the work that generates the bill, but then there's somebody like me standing behind them, taking the records and saying, okay, that's a 99213, that's a 99204, and, we'll, and this, those numbers will make, a sec, uh, make sense to you in just a second. Right? And that's how the money then gets made. Right? <clears throat> so most physicians, because it's kind of fun, I teach this to physicians because they don't actually, you know, in, in this leadership course, I, I teach one of the, one of the, I do the finance segment of the leadership course and I'll show them this stuff and they're like, oh, okay, now I understand how I get paid. Um, you know, it's kind of, kind of entertaining. Um, and that's just an example of how modern medicine has become so specialized because not that long ago, physicians were independent practitioners, we talked about this in previous lectures about the history of healthcare, right? Physicians used to be kind of on their own, doing their own thing, you know, bleeding you or making you vomit or whatever it was, right? And we progressed through time and then they actually had, had things that they could do to you that would actually make you better, right? And then as that progression worked, right, as medicine started to actually work, right, as we moved into the, into the industrial age, then medicine went into the process of what, what our book calls corporatization, right? Which is physicians started to group together, come together into groups, and they started, started moving from being independent entrepreneurs, if you will, right? So, so independent practitioners into employees. So there's a long tradition of physicians being what it amount to medical entrepreneurs, meaning they were their own bosses, they ran their own shop, and then as health insurance took hold and the practice of medicine both evolved in terms of moving away from the individual provider being able to do everything in her or his office, as well as as the financing of healthcare became more complex, it became worthwhile for physicians to partner up. And that was the, that's the corporatization process that's happened kind of in the mid 20th century. So like from the forties onward you saw this process of physicians starting first going from single practitioners into groups and then the groups getting bigger, right? And then the groups merging with hospitals. So a good example of that is uh, Exeter Health Resources. So Exeter Hospital down the street is part of a, a, an umbrella organization called Exeter Health Resources. And they have a, um, a multi-specialty physician group called core physicians that employs, I don't wanna to get totally wrong. I wanna say over, it's, a, it's about 150 physicians, right? So, that, so, they're, so both core physicians and the hospital are owned by the same parent company. And the idea is to help them coordinate and cooperate. Main medical, uh, those of you who are from say like the Portland area might get your care at Maine Health, right? Um, through the Maine Medical Center. And your physicians now, they may not have been when you were growing up, but, but main medical partners is the physician group that, is, is, that represents almost all of the physicians that are part of main health. So you have main medical center is the main, is the main M-A-I-N, main medical center for the main M-A-I-N-E health system, right? Um, so, but then they also own a bunch of other hospitals as well that are kind of part of this big system. That's the corporatization process. Why have this, has this all come together? Well, medicine has become more complicated to deliver the care, right? Now a physician, right? We talked about compliments last time. You know, 
a surgeon is pretty useless if she doesn't have an OR with a trained, a, a, a group of trained uh, OR nurses and technicians without, an, you know, without all the equipment. Most surgeons can't afford to buy their own million dollar Da Vinci robot. So they rely on the hospital, right? So we talked about the hospital as physician's workshop. It's just becoming more and more so. Um, and I will argue actually that it's now, it's kind of peaked and maybe is actually starting to splinter out again, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. But not only that, the process of actually billing and collecting um, your revenues has become more complicated. So we're gonna talk about, and we're gonna talk about a couple of these things today. We will start with this idea of fee for service, fee for service reimbursement. So fee for service means you go and see your doctor and you say, you know, my knee hurts. And the doctor says, okay, let me examine you. Um, you know, take, take um, you know, take 800 milligrams of Motrin three times a day for the next three weeks. If it still hurts in three weeks, come back and see me again, All right? That's, that's, you know, so they'll give you a, and then they're gonna give you a bill. And we're gonna talk about fee for service involves coding. Um, and so, so the, when the physician sees you, if you're an established patient um, and you're an otherwise healthy young person and it's, you, got, you hurt your knee because you fell down uh, when you were you know, dancing at the club or something like that, um, which totally looks uncool, but you, know, uh, but you survive. And um, so you're otherwise a healthy young person. They will code you um, for a relatively low intensity visit and then they'll send a bill and we'll show you that bill. So fee-for-service, the concept of fee-for-service um, is that uh, you get basically a fee every time you do a service. So what's the incentive there? If I get paid every time you come through the door, right? And the more things I do to you while you're in my office, the more money I make, what's my incentive? Do I want you to come often? Or do I want you to stay away and try to take care of yourself? I want you often, right? I want you to come in often, regularly, right? I want to do as many things to you as I can that I can get away with, right? Um, and if you're not paying the bill because you have very nice health insurance, or maybe you pay like five bucks to see me or something like that, you're not going to care if I bill for five different things. You're not going to be like, hey, doc, you know, you didn't really give me any sort of, you know, when you told me that I should eat more kale, that wasn't really like dietary counseling. That was just like this one thing you said. Um, and yet there's a, you know, on the bill here is a code that says you gave me dietary counseling. I'm not going to pay that. Like if, if you're paying five bucks for your visit, you're not going to take the time to argue with the doctor about what they coded. I'm not saying, and, and that's actually illegal. What I just described is kind of illegal. Like, like if they're totally BSing what they're doing, that's illegal. But but there are things that that if you're not paying, if if a third party is paying for your care, you're not going to look all that closely at the bill to begin with, and, and it's not worth your time to argue about. Well, did, was it really a, you know, a, was the complexity of my visit really? And we'll get into this, you know, a level four versus a level three visit. Um, you know, those are things that the doctor has to kind of prove in terms of their medical record. Um, but you're not going to fight with them if it's not uh, if it's not coming out of your pocket, right? You don't have any skin in the game. Is what you know to use the um, the colloquial phrase, right? So we've got a couple of historically hospitals hospitals. So here we're going to go back to hospitals where build build out um, under under insurance under the original kind of Blue Cross insurance that we talked about that evolved out of the the Baylor plan. Um, hospitals used to bill and Medicare accepted this process called cost plus. So in the 60s through to the early 80s, if you were a Medicare beneficiary or you were a Blue Cross beneficiary, but, but and Medicare, because it insures so many people, tends to kind of lead the way in how billing is done. And so if you were, you know, let's say your grandmother got sick in 1979 and had to go to the hospital and your grandmother was 65 or older and covered by Medicare. 
the hospital would have taken care of her, right, for however many days she was in the hospital. And they would have added up each day all the things they did, right, and calculated how much did it cost us to provide the care to your grandmother. So the hospital saying, this is how much it cost us to provide your care to your grandmother. And then they would add on to it um, a, a certain amount of percentage uh, for profit, and they would submit the bill to Medicare. And this is called cost plus. So the example would be, imagine that her total care cost the hospital, according to their accounting systems, $100. Well, what they would do is they would then submit a bill to Medicare for $105. Medicare would allow them to submit a bill for $105, right? Um, and they would, that would allow them to have a profit because every organization has to make a profit. Even nonprofits, despite the name, despite the kind of legal category, nonprofit organizations have to make a profit. They can't lose money every year or they will shut down. And the profit that a hospital makes from its operations, they turn around and they reinvest that money. So as a nonprofit, they're not allowed to like pay their executives obscene amounts of money and they're not allowed to like give the money away. What they have to do is they have to take that, let's say in this case, that extra $5 that they earn, they have to take it and reinvest it in the organization. Well, what does that look like? Well, if you build a hospital today, 10 years from now, it's gonna have a lot of wear and tear on it. Right? So at some point you have to renovate it and improve it. So that's one reason why even a not-for-profit has to make some profit because it has to make some money so that it can reinvest it and repair the organization, you know, repair all the equipment or buy new equipment or build new, you know, make the hospital even bigger. So there's nothing wrong or unethical with a not-for-profit hospital making a profit. They have to make a profit. Okay, so the hospital system very smart hospital administrators look at, looked at this system, this cost plus system, and they said, okay, how do I maximize my profits? Well, how do I maximize my profits under a cost plus system? Well, if I'm getting reimbursed, if I'm getting, if my profit comes from, is based on how much my expenses are, so I get a percentage of my expenses, what's my motivation? in terms of my expenses. Am I going to make my expenses smaller? Right? Or am I going to try to make my expenses bigger? What do you think? I'm gonna make them bigger, right? Because 5% of 200 is $10, 5% of 100 is $5. Which would you rather have? $10, right? It's pretty simple stuff, right? the, the math here behind it. So what you see now is, and so what does that mean to you as a hospital administrator, as, as the president of the local community hospital, under cost plus, what are you going to do? Well, you're gonna keep patients maybe a little longer. You're gonna push that margin to keep, you know, grandma, we're gonna keep grandma for seven days instead of four days or three days, if we can, if we can justify it, we'll keep her for seven days rather than four days, right? Because if I keep her for seven days, I get three more days worth of expenses, okay? <clears throat> so everything in healthcare was built around, as a result, was built around how it's, everything in healthcare is always built around how it's reimbursed just like every other industry. This is not like a, like a, oh, healthcare people are evil. No, they're just responding to incentives just like every other industry does, just like you do, right, um, every day. So, so hospital administrators being pretty smart people um, uh, start, build a system based on uh, trying to increase expenses because their reimbursements are based on their expenses and the more expenses they have, the more profit they make. Right? So you see this healthcare system kind of ballooning up, which is what happened after Medicare was passed. Very quickly, we thought we'd get, you know, so in 1965, we looked and said, healthcare is not that expensive. We can afford to buy that for everybody. Oh well, yeah, as soon as people realize, you know, as soon as the hospital administrators realized they could make a ton of money off of Medicare, 
they started building more hospitals. So this is another thing that was happening in the 50s and 60s was we're going to modernize and make sure that every community has a hospital. So there was a, there was a, um, a law passed that provided a lot of incentives to build more hospitals. So we started building more hospital beds and more hospitals, right? And then all of a sudden we, we turned around and said, wow, we're spending a lot of money on Medicare. That's a lot of money, right? And they, so they said, okay, this cost plus thing, it's not working so great. So in the early 80s, the federal government passed a new law, Congress passed a new law that changed the way that hospitals were reimbursed. And they shifted from cost plus to uh, prospective payment. So prospective payment, prospective means in advance. So instead of, instead of, um, instead of retrospective reimbursement, which is what cost plus is, right? Retrospective means we're looking back. So under cost plus, what we do is you tell me how much you spent and then I reimburse you. Prospective payment means I'm gonna tell you how much I'm gonna pay you in advance of you actually delivering the care. So that's really what prospective payment was. And so what, so what that, so there's a couple of variations on this, but kind of the general gist is Medicare working with the AMA, the American Medical Association came up with a coding system that we'll look at in a minute um, that then says, this is how much we're going to reimburse you for gallbladder surgery hospital, right? So first it was with the hospitals. So hospital, this is how much we're gonna reimburse you for if you do gallbladder removal. So it used to be a gallbladder removal, right? So you, uh, uh, if, and gallbladders go bad, um, they're pretty, it's, and it's, it's pretty simple surgery to have it out, uh, particularly today. But your gallbladder helps you digest, it kind of, so my understanding and you guys with the, you know, probably many of you know more about this, but kind of my understanding of the gallbladder is it's like a reserve for, for bile. It helps, um, which you need to break down fatty foods. So if you, um, that sound right, Alila? All right. So I'm going to rely on all this, the wisdom of the crowd in here. Um, so whatever it does, right? If you take it out, um, if you take it out, you have to be more careful with your diet because you have trouble digesting fatty foods. So if, you're a, if you wind up having your gallbladder out, you probably don't wanna to go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac and a, a large fry and, right, and, a, and, a, and a shake, right, with tons of fat, because it'll, it'll, it'll make you feel sick. So it used to be you get a gallbladder surgery under the old system, right? Old school gallbladder surgery would be, you know, they'd zip you open, big, 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 you know, opening. They'd go in, dig around, pull out your, your decrepit gallbladder, right? Stitch you back up and you'd probably spend a week in the hospital. Then in 1982, we implemented the prospective payment system. And so the hospital would get paid for this, for providing the surgical space, providing the surgical team, providing the supplies for the surgery, right? Um, providing the pre and post operative care and then the recovery for seven days. So they'd get, a, they'd get this giant, they'd send this giant bill, right? And then they'd get 5% on top or whatever it was, um, and it varied. I'm just using 5% because it's an easy number. <clears throat> Under fee-for-service, what Medicare said now was, for gallbladder surgery, we will pay you $2,000. Or, and I'm just pulling that number out of the air. We will pay you, say, $2,000. It is up to you, hospital, to deliver that care for under $2,000. If you can do it, if you can deliver the care for less than $2,000, then you get to keep the difference. But if it costs you more than $2,000, don't call us. We won't call you. That's all you're getting. End of discussion. So what very quickly happened? What do you think happened? So now instead of getting to, you know, go through the retrospectoscope and, and, and get, you know, a reimbursement based on how much you spent, what do you think happened? Gallbladder surgeries went from costing, let's say $5,000 to costing how much? If the maximum they're gonna pay is 2,000, something less than 2,000, right? So suddenly, how, and so what did that magic, how did that magic happen? Well, a couple of things. 
first of all, they realized very quickly that you don't really need to be in the hospital for seven days. So the, so the, so the length of stays started shrinking. They immediately went into the hospital administrators with the nurses and the doctors immediately started saying, okay, team, we're only getting $2,000 for this, for this care. How do we get that cost down from 5,000 that we've been billing to below $2,000? Well, no, number one is we need to get the patients out of the hospital faster, right? So that immediately, you know, so length of stay for everything, not just gallbladder surgery, but for everything started to shrink. Normal vaginal delivery, right? Many of you will, will go through that uh, process at some point. Um, used to be first baby, you'd stay for a week to recover. Normal vaginal delivery today, 48 hours, you're out. First baby, second baby, 24 hours, you're out, right? So it used to be you'd stay for a week right, after a normal vaginal delivery. That means no, no complications in the delivery. Right? Not a C-section, not a, you know, anything else. <clears throat> Healthy baby, so on. Um, so hospital administrators working with their teams immediately started to shrink down um, the, the length of stay. What else happened? Well, we talked about this last time, laparoscopic surgery. Suddenly that was worth doing, right? So surgeons started developing procedures that would allow faster recovery. Why? Because they got paid better if, they, if you could get them out of the hospital faster. So they developed the laparoscopic surgery, which is the, you know, the, 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 the surgery that we talked about last time with the long tubes, with the little, you know, with a camera on one end and, a, you know, little blades and whatnot. I'm totally out of my depth talking about these things. But, you know, but the point was we go from instead of zipping your whole belly open to making a couple of little holes and ch -ch 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 doing it that way, right? Um, Recovery time, because we didn't zip you open, recovery time is much faster, right? And so gallbladder surgery today is like 24, is, is like a 24 hour stay. Like you, you, um, uh, maybe even outpatient. It can maybe even be done outpatient, meaning you don't do spend the night. Um, so we've gone from seven days to 24 hours, maybe even outpatient, right? Um, and that's all a response to how the organization is paid, how the organization is reimbursed. Because I will tell you, if it was still cost plus, you'd still be spending a week in the hospital for gallbladder surgery, right? So they changed based on PPS. So we're gonna talk about, so it starts with inpatient, then eventually goes to outpatient services as well. So we'll talk, I'm gonna show you here in a minute, the ICD-10 system, which is how you, uh, so DRGs, diagnostic related groups, um, when you're diagnosed with, you know, okay, this person has a bad gallbladder, whatever that, there's a code for it um, in the ICD-10 code book that we'll look at in a minute. And it is on the ICD-10 is, is one of the files that I've uploaded. You won't need it for exam or anything. I'm just gonna show it to you because there's some funny codes in there uh, that, that always make me laugh. And hopefully you'll laugh at them too. Um, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, but uh, they code, you know, for a gallbladder, and then there's a, a dollar amount associated with for reimbursement based on that code. Right? Same thing, eventually happens. Uh, a little later happens for um, physician services. They go from um, kind of usual cost to this prospective payment system where the payment is based on the RVU, relative value unit. So a relative value unit is a number that's associated with a couple of different factors for a physician work. It includes the difficulty of the work, um, the resource intensity of the work. So first of all, is the work that the physician is actually doing hard? Does it take a long time? Does it require a lot of resources to support the physician doing it? And then how likely are you to be sued for um, uh, if based on doing this procedure. So how often does someone who does this procedure get sued? And that's called your malpractice RVU. I'll show you all of those in a second. Okay, but the point is we've gone from kind of this retrospective perspective to this prospective payment system and it changes everything. Let me just make sure. So, uh, you know what, I'm gonna stop that for a minute. 
I'm going to show you. All right, this is called the ICD-10, um, and it is, a, it is a list of codes that physicians use to provide the diagnosis for your patient, right? And this is used both inpatient and outpatient. So if you go to see the, your physician um, and you've got a complaint, there's some 20,000 codes in here that the physician is going to, to reach into to, to, to label what they're treating you for. So, um, so for example, I've got the, the one I happen to have highlighted is a uh, fracture of angle of mandible initial encounter for open fracture. So that mandible is your jaw. So you, you know, maybe, you know, uh, uh, Carol was down at Car Caroline. Caroline was down at, you know, at Scorps this past weekend and she got into a brawl uh, you know, she might've had a few, you know, a little bit of this, uh, and then she gets into a brawl, you know, over, uh, you know, over who was the best, uh, curling, uh, team at the Olympics, um, and gets punched in the, you know, gets, gets punched in the, in the jaw, breaks her jaw, goes to, goes to the emergency room, um, and they, they, they go to look at her and they say, okay, you've got a open fracture a fracture of the of angle of mandible initial encounter for open fracture. And they would code in, they'd write in her record, S0265XB, right? Um, now, let, you know, if there was something else, and so there's this whole long, and you can see there's this whole laundry list of different kinds of fractures, right? Um, so they'd say that, and then they would do some procedure based on it. They'd be like X-ray of mandible, right? And then they do, I don't even know what they, you know, wiring of jaw, right? Something like that. Those, these are pr the procedures that would be then done to Caroline, right? To fix it. So the insurance company, when the insurance company gets the bill before they pay it, they're gonna be like, okay, open fracture of jaw. Okay, jaw x-ray um, and wiring of jaw, whatever those procedures are. And we'll look at some of the procedure codes in a minute. Um, what they're looking to, to do is, is align what was done to the patient with what the with the what the um, diagnostic code is, right? So if 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 there's a diagnostic code for um, frac you know fracture of jaw, and the and then an X-ray of her leg, they're gonna be like the insurance company is gonna be like no, nope, you know reject, right? Because what you what you gave her a diagnosis for was jaw, and what you did to her had to do with her leg, so reject. Um, but these numbers, these, these codes also then drive the in, on the inpatient side, drive how much reimbursement you could get. So let's look at a couple of, of these. Uh, it's gonna be hard for me to do. I uh, want to do F121. So you're having a good time on Friday night, and maybe you get a little too carried away with your cannabis uh, that you picked up down at the dispensary in um, Massachusetts before you came back up to campus, right? And you wind up getting taken to the ED because you're, you know, talking about little green men coming out of the ceiling or whatever. Um, this is the code that the ED would use, right? Cannabis abuse with intoxication delirium. Um, so there's a code for it, right? Uh, so this is this would then drive whatever procedures they could do to you. If it required an admission, there would be an, an amount of uh, a, a reimbursement to the hospital. Um, something less kind of fun. Mm. 
M four eight four zero XA. Now here's a fatigue fracture of the vertebra. That's your back, right? Site unspecified initial encounter for a fracture. So this fatigue fracture means you've you you know you're that would probably not be one of you guys. It'd probably be somebody like me, right? A little older, right? Fatigue fractures. You know, I've, I've um, uh, you know overdone something and it's resulted in uh, for fracture of the vertebra. So that would be something that would be used to justify the admission and would justify surgical intervention or some other invention. Uh, how about this one? So that's kind of, you know, kind of boring. How about this one? Uh, w615, one XA. What if you're bitten by a goose? Well, there's a code for it if you're bitten by a goose. Right. And here's one of the fun things about this. So you have uh, bitten by goose initial encounter. And then if you get bitten a second time by the goose, there's a bitten by goose subsequent encounter. And if you're dumb enough to stick around and let the goose bite you yet again, there's a code that says sequelae, which basically means this guy's a dummy and, and isn't running away. Right. So sequelae just means three or more. In this, in this case, right, Se sequen you know, in, in sequence. Uh, or you could be struck by a goose. I'm not sure exactly how one gets struck by a goose, but you, know. um, you can get bitten by a duck, pecked by a turkey, right? So there's all these great codes in here. Um, yes, question or? You've been hit by a bird? Okay. Okay. Oh, so like flew at you and hit you? Okay. All right. So there you go. There, there's your real, you know, real story right there. Alila has been hurt by, you all thought I was just picking on Alila. She's got some crazy stories. All right. How about this one though? I bet Alila, you haven't done this one. V N seven three three X A. Sucked into jet engine initial encounter. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is the one that really makes me laugh because how does one get a second encounter with a sucked into jet engine? Like what was left of you um, to be sucked in a second time, let alone sequelae, right? Like had you not learned your lesson the first time not to you know, get sucked into a jet engine? But apparently some people don't, hence there was a need to have you know, uh, sequelae. So I find that kind of humorous. Now there's a, I'm, I'm playing with the fun ones, right? But the, the point of the, of the of this is to show you that there are just enormous numbers of, um, of codes, uh, some of which are kind of wild and crazy, and some of which are, you know, a little more vanilla. Right? But these, this is now what drives um, billing. This is the starting point of all billing by the healthcare system. I'm going to show you real quick. Um, So you can flip through that uh, uh, if you'd like. Uh, it's, on, it's on Canvas and you can look at it. You wanna find some funny things to tell your friends about. <clears throat> um, now, this is, this is the um, relative value schedule uh, for, for physician care. This is how physicians actually bill. So the, the ICD-10 gave us the diagnostic code. So you had to say things like pecked by turkey, right? And then there had to be appropriate treatment for being pecked by a turkey, right? You're not going to, I don't know, do a gallbladder removal if you were pecked by a turkey, right? So they're, they're, the, 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 the codes have to line up. Um, but this is how, this is, so the uh, CPT codes, right? Uh, common procedural terminology, um, that's what these are, um, say what the um, provider actually did to you. Um, so these are not great examples. I'm gonna do, cause I, I, don't, I don't know what most of these mean cause I'm not a coder, 
Um, but what I'm going to show you are some very basic ones. So 99203. So these are referred to, there's a subset of them referred to as evaluation and management codes. Um, and they start with 99201 and they go down to uh, 99215 and there's kind of a set of 10 of them. And these are the ones that I'm gonna expect you to be familiar with for the exam. Uh, and I've got, these are separated out. These are separated out onto a, the, the RVU example sheet that is in your, um, uh, is also on uh, Canvas. So, um, so a physician, if you come in to see a physician, maybe you've been pecked by a turkey, right? And you come in to see a physician, I'm not sure that you can actually come in and see a physician if you've been sucked into a jet engine, but whatever, uh, apparently somebody does. Uh, but let's say you've been pecked by a turkey. Um, you would then go to see your doctor, potentially, you know, let's say on an outpatient basis. Um, so it's not an emergency. You wind up going to, you know, getting an appointment to see your regular doctor. So there are two broad categories within these office visits. The first one is office visit outpatient visit new, right? Uh, and then office visit outpatient visit established, EST. So the 9920 series, the five that the five codes that have 99201 to nine down to 99205 are for an office visit for the first time with a provider. So um, if Angela goes to see a brand new provider that she's never seen before, um, they will be coding from the 9920 series. If she goes to see her established provider, so the provider has seen her at least one other time, right? then she would be in the 9921 211 to 215 series. So if Angela gets pecked by a turkey and then goes to see her regular doctor and it's a relatively uncomplicated visit, like there's nothing else going on except that maybe she got pecked by the turkey, right? Got, maybe got pecked on her hand, right? And she just wants to get, go in, maybe, um, uh, maybe get some uh, antibiotics or something like that. So it's not, a, it's not a serious injury, probably doesn't require an x-ray or anything like that. Uh, they would probably, uh, and I'll, let me, I'll pull up the other ones a little better. I'll pull up, um, it would probably be either a 99212 or a 99213. So as the numbers go up, so from a level one visit to a level five visit, level one is the simplest, level five is the most complex. And they, there is a time component to this, as well as a complexity component. So there are, are um, what the physician is being reimbursed for. So these codes, these 10 codes are referred to as E and, e and M or evaluation and management. So E and M, you'll hear them, E and M. Um, e and M codes, evaluation management codes. And the reason they're referred to that is because the physician is engaging in kind of mental work. The main thing that's happening here is the physician, nurse practitioner, or PA is engaging in an evaluation of your injury and then deciding on how to manage that injury, hence evaluation and management. <clears throat> so as we scroll to the right, so let's pick one. Let's say it's a established visit, you know, established patient. Well, you know what? I'm going to work off the other sheet because you're going to be using that anyway. So these are these are different. Let me take a put a pin in in our our story of Angela and the turkey. Um, so these are E and M codes, but you can see, you know, there's and those are for office visit outpatient. If you're if you're a physician, if your patient is admitted to the hospital, the physician that sees the patient in the hospital is going to use a code like initial hospital care. Um, for example. So these codes apply both on an outpatient side in an office, but also in the hospital. So when a surgeon goes in to do a procedure on you, um, they will also bill, let's see if I can find one, it's kind of fun. So they, well, that's not a good one.
All right. So if they go to do this, uh, I don't really know what this is. Well, let's see. Let's go to this next one. Whoop. Let's say, you know, Caroline really got into it at the bar and the girl she was going at, you know, pulls out a crowbar and hits her in the face. Uh, and she has to have her reconstruction of mid face done. Um, uh, what the physician would then, this is a clearly a surgical process, right? So it's happening in a hospital. Um, and so we scroll across here uh, and we see the first column here is called a work RVU. The work RVU is meant, to re is meant to recognize the amount of actual labor the physician is putting into the, into the procedure or care, right? So in this case, that's a big number, relatively speaking. Like, so the average office visit is around, you know, somewhere around one RVU. So what you see here is 23 RVUs. That's a lot of RVUs. That's probably a long, complex surgery and it requires a lot of skill and effort by the surgeon. Right, so, that's a, um, so the work RVU, that first column um, is uh, uh, meant to capture um, the amount of effort for the, re I, I told you a minute ago, the reimbursement is based on three components. The first one is the physician effort. So that's the work RVU. <clears throat> so that's 23.15, that's a lot, right? Then you scroll over and then you have the next three columns. You have your non-facility RVU or your facility. So non-FAC non means non-facility. And then PE stands for practice expense practice expense RVU. That is meant to capture the resource intensity of the care. So on the one hand, we have what the physician is actually doing. On the second hand, we have kind of how much staff support, how much equipment would we need to provide this care? And it's a lot, right? 21 is a lot, yes ma'am. Practice expense, PE is practice expense. <clears throat> So you have, so a procedure either happens in a non-facility environment or in a facility environment. A facility environment refers to a hospital. Remember the doctor's workshop idea, right? Um, and then a non-facility practice expense means that it's happening outside of a hospital. So it's happening in a doctor's office. Now this is not going to happen in a doctor's office. Um, and so that's probably why we have the same number. This is just not going to happen. You're not going to do the reconstruction of a face in your, in your office. You're going to do it in an OR, right? Especially, I mean, I, and I can just say that based on the number of RVUs involved here, it's just, it's an intense process. You're definitely going to have, this is going to be a team. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I... I'm gonna, yes, urgent care would not be a facility. ED definitely is, right? So all ED codes are gonna have, are gonna be facility based, right? Because an ED does, it's like a, like, a, like a radiologist, not gonna be happening outside of a facility. I'm gonna double check urgent care because I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, okay, so then we have, the second code is the practice expense. That's meant to capture the amount of resources that are being brought to bear to take care of this patient. And then the third number is the MPRVU. I'll scroll over to it. Right, MPRVU stands for malpractice RVU. So that number reflects how likely or reflects the, the historic likelihood that if you perform this procedure as a physician, you'll get sued, All right? And so you add these three things together to get the total RVUs. And then that is turned into a bill. So let's do that now.
So this is the file. Well, you have all these files. This is the file you're going to want to download and have available to you. Okay. Um, so here we have. This is more. Up, I think this is a more updated um, file. These are updated annually. Uh, <clears throat> So this is going back now to just, these are just uh, DNMs plus a couple of other ones at the bottom, I, I, just for fun. Added, um, I've added psychiatric treatment with a patient, um, 60 minutes, an emergency, a kind of middle, middle, mid-level emergency department visit, uh, and then application of a lower leg sp splint. Those are three, ex three additional things. <clears throat> so I'm, on the exam, I'm going to ask you to calculate I'm gonna tell you this right now. I'm gonna ask you to calculate the reimbursement, the number of RVUs and reimbursement for um, an office visit. So let's look at these now. So let's go back to um, Angela and her turkey bite. Um, so let's say uh, that Angela gets turkey bite, right? And comes to see her doctor. Um, and the doctor said, the doctor treats her. Uh, so this is an established, she, a, a, Angela is going to see her doctor who she has an established relationship with. So that's going to put us in the second grouping, the, 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 the ones that have uh, 9921. So then we have to figure out what level is it? Is it 99211, 99212, and so forth down to 99215? Well, Angela is otherwise healthy. There's nothing really wrong with her, but now she thinks maybe she got bitten by a turkey, and now she thinks maybe that it's infected. So this is not a super complicated thing to do, to check, right? Um, so the doctor's gonna, you know, examine her, take her blood pressure, check a few other things just to make sure that the, the infection hasn't spread, right? Um, and she's gonna be in and out of that office in you know, 15 minutes. The level of complexity is, you know, relatively simple. So there are two components to determining um, one through five. One is kind of a, a raw time amount, which is annotated here, right? So if Angela is in and out in 15 minutes, she's gonna, and it's, and it's her established provider, which code are we gonna use? Two, 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 one, two. Two, oh, two would be, she's never met the doctor before. To one two means she's going to her established provider, right? So, um, so these all say, they all say either. So the coding says office O, o slash P is outpatient, EST established, right? And then high means high intensity, right? Up above office O slash P outpatient. New means the patient has never met the doctor before. Um, I'm not sure what SF stands for. Uh, low, moderate, high, right? <clears throat> okay, so Angela, otherwise healthy, has this, you know, turkey bite that's probably gotten infected, um, goes to see her doctor, 15 minute visit, probably gonna code out as a 99212, right? So, well, now we know that. What do we know? Well, she's seeing her doctor in her doctor's office. So we're gonna hold that, hold that thought in mind. So, okay, so we're now in a 99212, right? Um, the work RVU is going to be, Point 0.7. So a minute ago, when we were talking about Caroline's reconstruction, reconstructive surgery, we were talking about like 23 RVUs, right? So when I said, this is a really intense procedure, and I know it based on the number of RVUs, you can see the difference here. Turkey bite, 0.7 RVUs, reconstructive face surgery, 23 RVUs. Big difference here, right? Um, so... So Angela's physician is going to get 0.7 RVUs for um, the, the uh, uh, portion of the, of the visit that's focused strictly on 
his or her work. Then we have to figure out facility or non-facility. Well, it's not happening in a hospital, so it's non-facility, right? And you get one or the other, not both. You don't get to both be in a hospital and not in a hospital, right? It's like Schrodinger's cat, right? The, the, the joke is the cat alive or dead. Can't know until you open the box. So, so the cat is simultaneously alive and dead at the same time. I don't really understand that. Maybe one of you physics majors can explain that to me. But in, in medical coding world, there is no Schrodinger cat. You can't be both. You have to pick one or the other. So in this case, we're going to pick the non-facility RVU, and that's 0.88. So the practice expense RVU, non-facility practice expense RVU of 0.88. Now, why is the facility RVU 0.29 when the non-facility RVU is 0.88? Well, if it's a facility RVU, facility practice RVU, so the physician is delivering the care in a facility, right? As opposed to delivering the care in her office, the physician is borrowing all the equipment and personnel that belongs to the hospital. The hospital is a doctor's workshop, right? So it's kind of a community-based doctor's workshop. So when the physician is practicing in their own office, they're using their own stuff, right? Their own people. So we need to compensate them more for that, that fact. So the practice expense RVU goes down dramatically, typically. Um, when we see the care moving from non-facility into facility, because what's gonna happen if you get your care in a facility, you're gonna get a bill from the physician and you're gonna get a bill from the facility as well, right? So the example I used with, you know, that we were teasing Caroline with, right? About the, the reconstructive face surgery, the practice expense RVU is the same, whether it was facility or non-facility, because it's never gonna happen in a non-facility environment, right? So, so they just left the same number. But where you see procedures that could potentially happen either in a facility or in a non-facility, you're going to see the facility RVU be lower than the non-facility RVU. Why? Because the doctor is borrowing equipment and personnel that, don't, that they are not paying for, okay? So, 0.88 because it's happening in the doctor's office. And then at malpractice RVU is 0.05. Why is that? Uh, because there's a low likelihood of getting sued based on a nine, you know, the average 992 generates a very low probability of being sued. A minute ago, when we looked at that face reconstruction surgery, it was like two point something, right? So that shows much, 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 much higher probability of generating a malpractice suit. Okay, so we're not quite done yet. We're gonna, you could just say, okay, I'm gonna add up 0 0.7, 0 0.88, and 0 0.05, and that'll give me the total RVUs. Not yet. What we have to do then is make an adjustment based on geography. So, in New Hampshire, you're going to have a GPCI, um, geographic practice, something or other, right? What is a multiplier? Sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. You're going to have a multiplier based on the locality. You're going to get compensated more if you're doing a, a, a 99212 in downtown Manhattan than you are in downtown Durham, right? Because there are, first of all, people in New York are more likely to sue you because they're mostly bad people. I'm just kidding, they're just, they are. They're more likely to sue you. I'm not saying they're bad people. They're more litigious. So when I moved from, um, so I was stationed in Hawaii um, and then I moved to Louisiana and the insurance rates in Hawaii were really high, but everything in Hawaii is really expensive. So I was like, all right, you know, and then we lived in Honolulu, it's a downtown, you know, it's a down urban environment. So I'm thinking moving to rural Louisiana, my insurance, costs are going to go way down because now I'm out you know the biggest risk I have is hitting a cow you know wandering across the street in, in rural Louisiana or an alligator or something um, <clears throat> uh, when I got to Louisiana and I called up my insurance company I said all right shift me over from from uh, Hawaii to Louisiana they said sure your rates are now 30 percent more expensive and I said what um, you know, and I was like, but it's a, you know, all the stuff I just said, we're a rural environment. I'm going to run over an alligator, maybe, you know, like blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The problem is that people in Louisiana like to sue each other a lot. 
Um, and so, you know, insuring you in Louisiana is actually more expensive, despite the fact that you now live in a rural environment um, and you, you know, have much less likelihood of actually getting in a traffic accident. If you get in a tra traffic accident, you are much more likely to get sued. And so it's actually more expensive to cover you. So this is the reality that's happening in this um, geographic adjustment is a bunch of different things are being factored in. The cost of providing care in Manhattan is way more expensive than Durham because, you know, to get, I don't know if you've lived in New York. I mean, the, I, I visited, my sister lived in New York in the 90s in Hell's, what was formerly Hell's Kitchen. Um, you know, and she lived in this like 400 square foot apartment her shower, her bathtub was literally in her kitchen. Um, and like, you know, took a, you know, if you want to take a shower, you were standing in the kitchen, just a, a real crap hole. And she was paying like, I don't know, probably in today's dollars, it was like $2,500 a month, you know, something like crazy like that. Um, and so you're going to adjust for things like geographic expenses. So in New Hampshire, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the work RVU 0.7 times 1.0, we're going to multiply the practice expense RVU, um, which is a non-facility in this case, by 1.0. So this is pretty easy stuff, right? And then we're going to multiply the malpractice RVU by So we're going to, our math is going to look like that. So 0.7 times 1 is 0 0.7, 0 0.88 times 1 is 0 0.88, 0 0.05 times 0.92 is 0.046. I'm running out of, didn't plan that one very well. So I add up 0.046 plus 0.88 plus point, oh, uh, whoops, point 0.7, and I get 1.626 RVUs. Okay, so that's my measure of RVUs. So this is meant to provide us with a, a sense of the intensity of the care. This is then translated or converted into a bill. So with, in this year, let me see if this is. Going back to our um, slide here. Um, the Medicare conversion factor, and I know people watching this at home, you can't see it, but it's just, I'm just showing one number. And that is the conversion factor is $34.89. Per RVU, right? So let me. So thirty four eighty nine per RVU times one point six two six RVUs, right? So that's dollars per RVU. So the RVUs cancel thirty four point eight nine times one point six two six. is 56.73. So that's how much Angela's physician would bill Medicare if Angela was actually 65 years old, which she's not, unless you're very well preserved 65, which I don't think she is. Right. Um, so that's, that's how you calculate a physician bill. Let's try another one. Let's see if we look over here. All right, so who can I pick on? What's your name? 
Kaylee. All right, Kaylee is heading out on spring break next week. And um, she's having a good time down in, where do you wanna go, Kaylee? Florida, she's having a good time in Florida. She's out in, she's out in uh, uh, Miami on, 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 on South Beach. Uh, she gets some rollerblades and she's rollerblading in, you know, in her bathing suit like they do down there. And she slips and falls um, and you know, bangs up her knee let's say. So now she, um, she says, ah, you know, it hurts a little bit. I, I think I'm going to go get, you know, go get it looked at. Uh, doesn't, doesn't have a doctor because she's actually lives up here in Durham or wherever home is, uh, but it's not Miami. Um, so she goes to a CVS minute clinic, right? One of the, which is one of those nice innovations that they have where you can just get a, you know, a quick appointment, even if you don't have a relationship with the provider. Um, she goes in and provider looks at it, says, yeah, you're, you know, you're young. Yeah, it hurts a little bit, but it probably doesn't need an x-ray. So quick examination tells her, okay, you know, take, uh, take 800 milligrams of Motrin three times a day uh, for the next two weeks. And if it's still bothering you when you get back home, go ahead and go see your regular provider. So in and out uh, visit, probably about 15 minutes. What code would we use? Nine nine two zero two, right? Why nine nine two zero two? Because the provider is this a new or an established patient? New patient. Provider's never seen Kaylee before, right? Probably won't again. So now we're going to have new patient, and then there. So so let's jot down. And then it's happening in a CVS. So that's, is, is, is that a hospital or not a hospital? It's not a hospital, right? So that means it's a non-facility practice expense. So we're gonna do 99202, right? So the work RVU is gonna be 0.93. The practice expense RVU is going to be uh, 0.41, sorry, 1.1. That was the practice expense, non, non uh, facility practice expense. And then the malpractice RVU is going to be 0.09. Right. Right. But we know, you know, right, wait, wait, there's more. We go down here and see um, Florida. I think there's actually a, a GPCI specifically for Miami, but we'll pretend there isn't. That this is, this is somewhere else, or that there isn't one, and we'll use we'll just use the rest of Florida as an example. So now we're going to have work RVU is going to be multiplied by one. The practice expense RVU is multiplied by one, and the non um, mile practice expense is multiplied by one point four four because people in Florida, there's lots of, you know, because people in Florida apparently like to sue each other a lot, right? Um, so now we just, and then we're gonna use the 3489 conversion factor. So how much is, is Kaylee's bill? Well, so first of all, how many RVUs is it? Who's got it? You don't have it? 2.15? Yep, that's about right. Okay, so let's... Oh, I scrolled down before you got a chance to see it. That what you're saying? Sorry. So... Scroll back up, right? So it would have been 0.93 work RVUs, 1.1 facility or non-facility practice expense RVUs, 0.09 malpractice RVUs, right? 
Then we're going to multiply that by the work RVU by one, the practice expense RVU by one, the malpractice uh, RVU by 1.44. And so, we wind up with 0.93 times one, of course, is 0 0.93. 0 1.1 times one is 1.1. And then malpractice 0 0.09 times 1.44 is roughly 0.13. So that you wind up getting 0 0.93 plus 1.1 plus 0 0.13, 2.16. So 2.16 RVUs times $34.89 per RVU. gives me 7536. Okay. So Kaylee's visit, which is took roughly the same amount of time as Angela's visit, bills out at about 25% more. Why would that be? I mean, they're roughly the same kind of injury, pecked by turkey falling down while rollerblading um, and trying to look wicked cool. Uh, both, right? About the same kind of level of injury. Why is it that the that Kaylee's bills out at fifty percent more than Angela's? Yeah. Yep. GPCI is higher. Absolutely right. So there. So it's more likely. So a piece of it is. A small piece of it is the fact that people in Florida like to sue people more than people in New Hampshire do. So that's not, you know, it's good to know. Um, but it was the first part you're saying, this is a new patient. The, the, the nurse practitioner has never met Kaylee before. So she has to do more work essentially to kind of uh, get Kaylee's medical history, right? To make a decision because she's kind of making a decision blind. Whereas Angela's provider knows Angela and knows kind of everything about Angela, has seen, been seeing Angela for years, whatever, right? And so she can make uh, a decision faster. All right, so that's, that's physician billing. And I'm taking a lot longer to do that than I intended, but that's the way it goes. So that applies both inpatient and outpatient. Um, it's just that the physician doing inpatient care um, is going to build is going to build a a build in the same way, right? <clears throat> so if you if you got that care, they'd use the right they would use a particular code for the work they did. Right, that would have a work RVU. It would have an uh, if it's in a hospital, you'd use the non-facility practice expense, and then your malpractice expense, and then there'd be that GPCI, GPCI adjuster. Okay, so uh, this relative um, resource-based relative value scale is an example uh, of trying to work with um, uh, of our PPS. Right, so it's, it's established in advance how much that service is going to cost. All right. Let's do, so we did that. So we're seeing a transformation of healthcare um, from fee for service. So that red line represents fee for service. And so what we have here is time on the uh, x axis. So as time goes on, the share of revenue that facility, hospitals are earning was almost all fee for service. It is gradually falling as we seek to move towards what the industry is referring to as value based care. So, value based care is instead of counting the things we've done to you, instead, we start to count your outcomes. Are you actually better off for having received the care that we gave you? That's the idea of value-based care. So instead of measuring the inputs, right, all the things we did to you, and then charging you for things we did to you, we're instead going to say, hey, we made you healthier, you have to pay us some money, right? And so that's the value-based reimbursement. 
Okay, so this is the big move today. We're really still at, you know, talking to, uh, talking to leaders in the healthcare industry. They'll tell me uh, we are really still at like 95% fee for service, right? But there are some major revisions to this that have happened over the last couple of years. So hopefully we'll get to here. So I wanna talk in the remaining time a little bit about this idea of alternative payment methods or referred to as APMs. You may hear healthcare people throwing that acronym around. We use a lot of acronyms in healthcare. Um, so uh, uh, one alternative method is capitation. Oh, I meant to delete the Keith Smith reference. So capitation is, has anybody been covered by Kaiser Permanente? Lived out in the you know, West Coast? So Kaiser is a, you know, one of the original HMOs we've talked about in the past. Uh, previously, right? Where basically what, what you do is you, you pay the insurance company, you pay Kaiser Permanente a fixed fee. You pay them your, your, your um, monthly premiums and then they provide all of your care for that. You, know, you might have a little copay to, you know, just to kind of keep you from using the, the, the emergency room every time you have a hangnail or something. But, but for the most part, you give them a payment and then they agree to provide all of your care. This is called capitation. They get a fixed payment, a per member per month payment, and then they provide all of your care for the, under that payment. So if you're, if you were working, for, if you and if Kaiser was out here and UNH contracted with Kaiser to provide the um, healthcare for it's you know, for the faculty, for example, or all the employees at UNH, what UNH would do is they would pay them a per member per month fee. Right? And, then, and then Kaiser would be on the hook to provide all of the care for the patient, for, for, for the beneficiaries. So let's say UNH agrees to pay them $1,000 a month per member per month, right? Which is close to what uh, UNH actually does spend on healthcare for its beneficiaries. It's actually a little more than that. Well, not more than that. Eh, let's say 700 a month per beneficiary. Kaiser agrees to then provide all of the care for those patients, whether they can provide it with their, and so Kaiser employs its own, has its own hospitals and employs its own physicians. So it's a fully integrated system. So if you, they get $700 a month, if, if whether you get sick or not. So if you get sick and you, get, you have to go see the doctor one time, they get $700. If you get sick and you have to be hospitalized for three weeks, they get $700, right? And so if you average that out over the entire population, it works out that they're getting enough money from UNH, for example, that they can cover all the expenses and then have a little bit of profit. So we'll talk about that in more detail next time. So see you next time.